Hello everyone, I'm Captain Morgan. Welcome back to the bunker. It's time once again for the counterintuitive and unintentionally funny comic vault. We return to the world of Smallville this week with another request from Ian McKee, and we are tackling the second volume of season 11. It's Detective, because it's Smallville, so the uh, episode titles have to be one word, and that's one that we didn't manage to use in 200-something episodes of the series proper. Um, so thanks a bunch to Ian. I uh, really appreciate you, man. Uh, so I reviewed the first volume a few months back and enjoyed it more than I expected to. I, there was a lot of tongue-in-cheek quality to Brian Q's, uh, Brian Q. Miller's writing that suggested he knew he was working with silly material that had just jumped the shark seasons before Smallville became a comic book. And so, to be authentic, he would continue with some of the same counterintuitive logic, change for the sake of change, eye-roll-inducing and obvious references to Superman lore, and some of the same formulaic writing and done-to-death plot devices. But unlike a lot of the TV series, this knows just what it is. It's not pretentious, and it doesn't take itself too seriously. And that makes it easy for me to just go on a ride with it. The second volume, which introduces Batman, finally, to the Smallville universe, something the creators and other writers wanted to do going all the way back, is wonderfully consistent with that tone and attitude. This stuff is junk food. It's not especially smart writing, though it's not head-smackingly stupid either, mostly. It's rarely thought-provoking. It relies pretty heavily on the novelty of getting to see stuff the series never got to. It's awkward with some of the story points from the series it's shackled to and wishes it wasn't, namely Lex's amnesia, but it's mostly the kind of schlock I can get behind. Like a lot of the series, this is kind of a guilty pleasure for me, but that's not even fair to Miller. It reads more like a thing designed to be a guilty pleasure. It falls in that category of what Roger Ebert called good trash. I know the Smallville fan base considers season 11 canon, and that's cool, but it doesn't read that way to me. Again, because of the tongue-in-cheek quality. It reads more like a what-if story to me. What if we got to see what Smallville was like after it really made no sense to even call it that anymore? The Superman period of Smallville. After Clark's taken on nearly his entire rogues gallery, built a Justice League, fought Darkseid, kinda, and in a world where his secret identity should become public in about five seconds. How crazy would that be? The answer, pretty crazy, which is what makes it so entertaining. I feel like an actual Smallville Season 11, had such a thing been possible, probably wouldn't be this much fun. It also feels like it's targeting a somewhat different audience. It goes without saying, but this isn't a teen drama anymore. It's a traditional superhero story that takes place after a teen drama. The distinction is important, because it's missing, at least thus far, a lot of what the non-Superman and non-superhero audience watched Smallville for. The soap opera stuff. I mean, some of that is here, but it's not in the forefront, and it's often obligatory. It's also almost making fun of it. Like, this isn't on the CW anymore, and it's not limited by a live-action TV budget, so we don't need to pad the narrative out with exchanges about intangible, ethereal concepts with hardly any practical context, and our characters don't have to be petty or oblivious or paranoid or insecure for no reason just to force drama. In this arc, Clark keeps expecting Lois to give him a drawn-out lecture for taking unnecessary risks. He thinks are totally necessary, which is what would happen in the show, but when she finds out that he did stuff like threatening to drop Bruno Mannheim from the sky so he could get information from him or tells Batman he's Clark Kent, he is shocked when she more or less just trusts his judgment and is totally reasonable about it. And those are things she would be totally within her rights to question. But it's like Miller has the freedom to actually allow his characters to get along now. So he's taking full advantage of that, while acknowledging what writing that show used to be like. I might have said this in the last review, but it reads like a catharsis for Miller. 
So Miller gets maybe a tad indulgent and jumps right to Batman after that introductory arc, and I can't blame him really, considering how badly that show wanted and kind of needed Batman, especially after it started introducing so many other heroes. And this Batman seems like one of the couple of ways I might have seen that show doing him, had it gone that way, uh, had it gone with a fully suited up Batman anyway, though it's a real shame we couldn't have had a Bruce Wayne during his training years who was friends with Lex. And that's what I always wanted to see. But sacrificing that for Batman Begins was well worth it, because of course Begins is the reason they weren't allowed to use that character. I would have expected Smallville to either make Batman relentlessly broody and dark, kind of like we did in uh, the the uh, crisis event just last year with uh, the Kevin Conroy version, you know, to try to make Clark look more altruistic by contrast. Or I would have expected something like this, where he's more or less the classic comic book Batman, but a little more lighthearted and quippier. I mean, everyone's quippy in Smallville, and everyone's doubly quippy in these comics. Every female character reads like Chloe with a twist. Lois is Chloe, but more jaded. Barbara, Nightwing in this, is Chloe, but more adventurous and bubbly. And so Batman is Oliver Queen, but a little angry, and still not as tortured as Oliver from Arrow. It's played like a big deal when this Batman smiles, but he does, and in costume. He banters with his sidekick, he's decisively not a loner, and even though he has the same reservations about Superman Lex does initially, he's quick to admit Superman is on his side and start working with him after their obligatory uh, fisticuffs in which Batman's got red sunlight shooting out through his chest emblem to weaken Superman so he has a chance against him, which is so Smallville. It pats itself on the back for being so clever when it's about the most fanfic-ish, over-the-top thing I can think of. But good on Miller for not giving Batman kryptonite in his Dark Knight Returns-esque Batman-Superman confrontation, only to resort to it later with the trickster. It will get very formulaic and uh, Smallvillian in how Clark will get affected by green kryptonite, uh, get hit by bullets for the millionth time just so that it can seem like he's going through some kind of conflict. Even Smallville! does BVS better than BVS, and weirdly a few years earlier. Batman doesn't trust Superman, so they have a big fight. But here, it's just to distract Superman, so Nightwing, who is, uh, because Smallville often didn't play the comic stuff straight, too good for the name Batgirl, can go get information from Green Arrow about Joe Chill without Superman stopping her. They're both reasonable, Batman and Superman, and start trusting each other because they realize they're on the same side, even if they approach crime fighting differently, and not because of a light switch moment that suddenly makes Batman do a 180 like he does in BVS. But in a bizarre twist of fate, the moment where Batman and Superman realize their mothers are both named Martha is also here. Again, years before it became the most infamous plot device in a superhero movie. Toward the end of the arc, Clark is comparing and contrasting himself to Bruce with a we're not so different you and I kind of speech. They both lost parents, they both believe in the sanctity of life, and they're both above revenge, as Batman proves to him when, instead of murdering Joe Chill on the spot, when they catch him, he tries to save Chill from the villains who want him dead. There's nothing especially new or profound in these comparisons. It's not the most compelling Batman-Superman story in pitting their worldviews up against each other and seeing that debate play out, but it does point out that their <laughs> moms both have the same name. It's maybe the first thing in comics that does that, I'm not sure. And while not as contrived as BVS, it still struggles to bring that up naturally in a conversation. Clark says, My adoptive mother is still alive, and I try to see Martha whenever I can. And Bruce is like, Hey, that's my mom's name too! Adopted or not, why would Clark Kent ever refer to his mother by her first name? But then everything is relative. Before BVS, I probably would have thought that was really stupid. Now I'm like, you know, my standards are, are, are lower. I'm like, well, there's no, why did you say that name? Or I thought you were the scariest threat to humanity five seconds ago, but since we have something in common, I now trust you implicitly. 
Uh, there is some debate about the differences in their approaches and philosophies, but this is one of those places where Smallville's history makes things really awkward for Miller. He's dealing with a Superman that has some pretty dark patches in his origin, despite acting and talking like Christopher Reeve all the time in this book. Like, when he takes down a terrorist and says, I think these children have gone through enough today without having to deal with your swearing. He's done all kinds of shady and morally ambiguous things on his road to becoming the classic Superman we all know, regardless of his upbringing. So, Miller knows he'd come off as sanctimonious and hypocritical if he was too critical of Batman's methods. And he sometimes finds those methods necessary himself, again like when he threatens to drop Mannheim, which does make him seem a little holier than thou when he's lecturing the public because he doesn't always practice what he preaches, but at least he's proactive in trying and is confident enough to say, look, I know this is wrong, but I have to do it and I won't cross the line, unlike what he was often in the series where he was just so impulsive, insecure, and too quick to act on however he was feeling in the moment, and then if he bid, did bad stuff, decided, oh, maybe I was destined to be evil. So rather than an interesting exploration of two different philosophies and approaches to crime fighting, we get a Superman and Batman who get along great very quickly because they find out they're just not that different. Batman is just altruistic enough for Superman because he doesn't kill the man who murdered his parents, and Superman is just morally ambiguous enough for Batman because he's not above intimidation tactics. It's not an offensive or ultra-cynical take on that relationship, but it's also nowhere close to fascinating. And it just screams, Batman should have been here five seasons ago. Miller does the best he can under the circumstances with this. I think. I do really like the idea of Superman and Batman's first adventure together being to try to take down the man who killed Batman's parents. If Batman doesn't lose himself to the darkness in that situation, Superman can trust him implicitly. And Superman's optimism is a good influence for Batman, and maybe helps temper him some. Although, that's not emphasized as much as I'd like. I also like Miller's take on Joe Chill, and not brilliant, but fresh and different. He manages to do what so many modern stories do in making Chill a more important figure than just a random thief in the night, which I much prefer. Here, he used to be a top-level member of Inner Gang and a weapons dealer. But, Miller also doesn't turn it into a grand conspiracy to kill Bruce's parents, so making him more important works a little better that I'm used to. Maybe uh, Chill was a petty thief then and moved up the inner gang ranks later. I'm fuzzy on how he wound up in that alley murdering Bruce's parents in this version. But the idea of the man who destroyed Bruce's life with a gun, giving him that aversion to guns, and being a gun runner is kind of interesting. And it's not an idea that's really developed, but I like it. And I also like the over-the-top and obviously poetic way Chill finally pays for his crimes. He gets frozen to death by Mr. Freeze, because his name is Joe Chill, in a book with a whole bunch of ice puns, just like Batman and Robin. Anywhere else, it's kind of silly. It is perfect for Smallville. There's a lot that's left out with this Batman so far that makes him hard to get a read on. I have no idea what his relationship is with Commissioner Gordon, who isn't brought up at all. And so I don't know for sure if this Barbara even is Barbara Gordon. I don't think her last name ever comes up. I didn't notice it. I'm assuming it is, but this is a Batman that isn't just fighting crime with her. He's going on missions out of town with her, basically living with her on this trip. The relationship seems totally platonic. She's his Robin right now, but it's strange not knowing what exactly their arrangement is and how this dynamic came about in the first place. Maybe I'll find out later. It's odd Alfred isn't here, with Bruce publicly appearing in Metropolis. Bruce mentions that he has a butler, so Alfred is definitely around, and Clark talks about him by name toward the end. Which is confusing, because I don't know why Clark would know about him. I, this is the first time they're meeting, and Clark figured out Batman's secret identity based on his voice which makes it even sillier that Metropolis is just a few hours away from Smallville, and yet no one has recognized Clark's face. 
I also like the look of this Batman fine with a mask that covers his entire face, like Batman Beyond, but it's awkward that it's both more and less realistic than a traditional Batman mask. I imagine that's so he's less likely to be recognized, which makes sense, but the fabric covers every inch of skin all the way up to his lips, which couldn't have been done on a TV show. I get that this is a comic, but a lot of the choices here seem to be like the Batman 66 comic. If we had a gargantuan budget, what could we have put on screen at the time when we made the show? So you're less limited, but you're still trying to do what you could on television. So it's not, now that it's a comic, we'll do things that are impossible to put in a TV show. But you get stuff like the Batman costume that is kind of like that. Subplots established in the first arc are inching forward, so I'll just touch on those. Lex is taking pills to suppress Tess Mercer's personality, whose essence is occupying part of his brain and seems to actually be the real Tess, not a figment of his imagination. So she knows everything the real Tess did, including a lot of details about his life that he's missing because of that infernal amnesia device in the series finale. And most important to Lex, she knows who Superman is. So Lex decides at the end, End, not to keep trying to get rid of her, but to try to find a way to force her to reveal that information. I like the discussion of A Christmas Carol and the question of which ghost she is in that analogy, past, present, and future. And Lex's op observation that he hasn't had a change of heart like Scrooge, only a change in how he's perceiving the situation. Which is especially interesting given his tragic refusal to take the right lesson from the events of Lexmas, which also harkens back to Dickens. That is a classic Lex scene. Chloe mentions her murdered Earth 2 counterpart and the warning about a coming crisis just so we won't forget about it, but there are no new developments about that here, and she finally tells Oliver she's pregnant at the end, so she feels more important to this arc. She's nervous about telling him because drama, I guess, and waits until the perfect moment, which is snow. Okay. That's the closest to an irritating relationship drama that we get, so not too bad by Smallville standards. I'm interested to see if Chloe and Barbara end up getting any panel time later and if Barbara ends up being uh, yet another computer genius because uh, she has to be called Watchtower uh, because she's not Oracle, uh, and I, I don't I don't know if there were any, uh, you know, issues with, like, you know, a bat embargo or anything, if they just weren't allowed to use uh, Oracle, if they decided that because she's not, in the, in the TV show, that because she's not uh, Barbara, she's this other character, she just shouldn't be called that, but I mean, she's essentially, uh, and, and she's in a clock tower, too, like, she's essentially doing what Oracle in Birds of Prey does, but is just called Watchtower, so I'm curious, and I think there's even, uh, like, like a, like a throwaway joke about Oracle, or a, or a mention, like, she thinks about using that name or something, I can't remember, it's been a while, uh, since I've watched the later stuff, but, uh, I wonder if there's a scene later where we, uh, where we'll, we'll see them, uh, together doing computer stuff. Uh, and then Clark and Lois still have to find creative ways to spend time together because Lex has a satellite tracking all of Superman's moves. Miller seems a little frustrated with this plot point, like he wrote himself in a corner that's just really cumbersome to get out of last time. It created great drama in the moment there and is just a very classic Lex move, but the longer Clark has that prison anklet, uh, for lack of a better way to put it, the more tedious it's going to be to believe Clark and Lois are even communicating without Lex knowing. Tedious to read, hard to believe. And it'll be nice when they can finally talk about something else. I guess they find a permanent way to get Lex off Superman's trail uh, next arc. I'll be surprised if that hasn't happened by then already. The art here is serviceable. It's pretty consistent, considering it's drawn by a stable of several artists I've never heard of. Chris Cross... Yeah, his parents had a sense of humor. Jamal Eigel, uh, Pierre uh, Perez, Kevin West, and Azel uh, Jimenez. Cross draws more issues than the others, but I can't tell if he's supposed to be the regular artist. Uh, and I forget how much of the the uh, the, the first arc uh, he drew. He draws all three digital issues of the first chapter of this, and then Eigel draws all the second. But it jumps around after that. 
Uh, in case you didn't see my first review, I'll mention this again briefly. Uh, this was a digital first series, so it's published in mini issues, and the pages are smaller to fit a phone or a tablet screen. So basically, it's uh, like the top two-thirds uh, without, th without the bottom third, um, panel-wise. That's the way I started reading it in digital form uh, in those mini issues, and I actually recommend doing it that way. This is, by the way, uh, available on DC Universe right now if you're subscribed to that service. Um, I like to read it that way because that's how it was intended. It looks great on a screen, and it's a better experience for the issue cliffhangers. I uh, never thought I'd want to do it that way, but it's won me over on the format. They're also collected and printed as regular-sized issues and as four-issue trade collections, I think. The art remains pretty cartoony, and the detail is minimal. It looks a little hurried in places, uh, not enough, you know, backgrounds and stuff, but the actor likenesses are usually decent, especially under Cross's pencil. I like Batman's costume design fine, uh, like I mentioned earlier. Um, it's really busy, just like uh, I would expect to see for television. Nightwing's suit is an original design that's kind of like a Robin Nightwing uh, amalgamation. It looks like a trapeze artist costume to me, or maybe the leader of a marching band in a parade. Uh, like, maybe it's the outfits that the Flying Graysons uh, decided not to use, uh, the rejected Flying Grayson outfits. I don't love the bird logo coming out onto the arms, not a big fan of that. There are panels where faces look ugly or unintentionally funny, like when Nightwing goes like this. Uh, and the panel layouts are nothing special, but sometimes aren't very well thought out. Like during a scene with Lex where there are four boxes, two on top of two, and it requires you to read them out of order. So you're supposed to drop down instead of reading to the right like you usually would, and it has to resort to an arrow to tell you that? That hasn't been regularly done since the 70s, and it's the only time the book does it, so it was clearly a mistake. There's no reason that picture couldn't have just been retooled to fit in the other box. I don't understand how in the 2010s that happens. And now, how about some dumb and ridiculous moments? Again, let me reiterate, a lot of this is what makes it both authentically Smallville and fun to read, and a lot of it works because of the lack of pretense. So I'm criticizing? But I'm not really criticizing. The headline about Batman and Superman is almost world's finest, but Lois thinks that's stupid. She says, world's finest what? So it's a reference to a classic comic thing and the obvious thing, but they don't play it straight because it's outdated, I guess. Otis and Barbara get a scene together because they're assistants to billionaires. There's something I never thought I'd I'd see happen. Otis from, from the Superman movies and Barbara Gordon. I think Barbara Gordon. I'm hoping for a romance between them. Uh, oh, Barbara? Barbatus? Yes, I'm shipping now. Lex says Bruce's family dodged a bullet. Not in those words. That would be too crass even for Lex here. Because they were almost involved in Veritas, but decided not to join Swan and Lionel's group to find the Traveler from the Stars. Yeah, lucky them. They just got murdered for a completely different reason instead. The prankster is a copycat of Toy Man who rips off his ideas, but has a distinctly different villain motif. That is kind of flimsy and weird. It's mostly there so Toy man can provide our heroes with information kind of Hannibal Lecter style, and so this story isn't riddled with nothing but Batman villains. So he has to team up with and then double-cross Mr. Freeze, who he tries to blow up, and we get a wonderfully entertaining moment, by the way, when Freeze says, I would advise you to stand clear, for you see I am about to explode. Uh, but Trickster's whole thing is that he cheats. He's, he's a cheater, and Toy Man doesn't like that. But he's a criminal. And I don't know what the rules are supposed to be, so I'm lost on what cheating means. And he says because he's not about toys, he's about tricks, he's not into fun. Okay? It's played like a jokes versus riddles idea, and it's just awkward. There's some talk about how pranks aren't fun, but they're not fun to the person being pranked. I mean, the prankster himself seems to be having all kinds of fun with the pranks he's pulling. Uh, especially this prankster. It's also odd to use a Flash villain in a world with Bart Allen, but not include Impulse in the story. 
And the reason we're given for why Clark can't move as fast as he did in the series, presumably so he has more traditional Superman abilities and can't essentially freeze time to get out of any situation now, which I kind of respect, the reason for all of that is, now that he can fly, he can't run as fast. Clark was able to fly most of the series. He just was afraid to and chose not to. It was like a mind over matter thing. He just couldn't... He couldn't fly because the rule of the show was no flights, no tights. That's why he couldn't fly. But in this, we're acting like there's some kind of ability trade-off? It is simultaneously the dumbest thing I've ever heard and the thing that most authenticates this is a Smallville story. The series is ridiculous. I am enjoying it immensely. Anyway, everybody, thanks as always for watching. I'll review some more Smallville Season 11 a few weeks from now. If you would like to uh, see me review a comic or a movie in this format, you can join the $15 tier on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash geekvolution, and you can do that one time, and then just uh, send me a message there on Patreon uh, for your request, and uh, I will knock that out for you. I'll put you um, on the list and get to you when uh, it's your turn, and if you want to stay on that rotation, you'll get a review from me every two to three months or so, or you can just do it one time uh, and let the pledge roll over and uh, then jump off after that for just for just uh, one request. Anyway, uh, you guys are awesome. I sure appreciate you as always. Hope you enjoyed the review. Leave your comments if you've read uh, any of Smallville Season 11 and this arc in uh, particular. Let me know what you thought of it, and in the meantime, I am Captain Logan, and happy reading.